Hello, Soul Spiralers. Welcome back to today's episode. Today, I have Kayla Nichols here with me. She is a yoga and Pilates teacher, and she owns an amazing yoga and Pilates studio called Morning Light, which I visit very regularly. (laughs) She's also a registered nurse and studying to be an Ayurvedic health counselor. She's a fellow free thinking Aquarian like me and has the cutest puppy Luna that she shares online quite regularly. So if you find her there, she has her own Instagram. (laughs) You'll be able to follow her too. (laughs) Thanks for coming on the podcast, Kayla. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have our chat today. Me too. I feel like our everyday chat is a podcast. (laughs) I know. I like have to like pull my way self away from the studio. I'm like, okay, I need to go do things now. I know like, do you actually work? Yeah, yeah. I talk to people all day and then I get really tired and then I'm like, oh my gosh, my day's done. (laughs) Where's your Mercury in astrology? I actually have no idea. Because mine's in Aquarius. I wonder if ours are in the same. That's where we always get chatting. I don't know, actually, to be honest. I just had this reading and I have it was that's so why I asked you because I knew you had I've it recently the replay and I have to rewatch <laughs> it and I've been procrastinating not doing it as we were just talking about <laughs> um, but yeah I, I'm not sure mm, I'm, I'm curious we'll have to learn well, usually the first question I do ask people though is to tell a little bit about yourself and your story and the things that brought you to who you are sitting in front of me today if you are open to sharing <laughs> yeah absolutely I would say The journey to where I am has been forever evolving, as is everyone's. I got into yoga probably when I was about 18 originally. Um, Before that, I was actually introduced to Pilates when I was 10. Um, My mum had all of these Windsor Pilates DVDs (laughs) that she, I'm pretty sure, got off online at like 3 a.m. one night. Yeah. Um, And I used to do that with her all the time in the lounge room. And I actually used to take my mum's DVDs to my friends' houses when I was like 10 and run them through these like Pilates classes. And I felt really like a pro because I knew word for word what she was going to say because I was like doing them so much. um, (laughs) So I feel like it was probably in my destiny to become (laughs) a Pilates teacher. Um, And then I I started doing a bit of gym when I was younger, um, reluctantly, very reluctantly. And at my gym, they had a Pilates class and I was like, oh, I love Pilates. So I did that. Um, And they had yoga there and I thought I would give that a go. And I, to be honest, absolutely hated it. I was just so busy in my mind. Um, The idea of sitting still to me just was like mind boggling. I I can't be with what's going on in my mind right now. I just wasn't ready. Um, So a bit later into that kind of journey at the gym, I ended up in a bar class because I'd done ballet since I was three to about 16 and just loved dancing and all things ballet. Um, Wasn't very good at it, mind (laughs) you. (laughs) But um, my friend said, why don't you come to this bar class? You'll you'll love it. It's about ballet kind of. And I was like, okay. And fell in love. Like just thought it was the most, I was like, why is it not, this not like public knowledge that this is the best thing in the world. And then um, probably did that for about six months. And then my teacher, who's my yoga teacher and my Pilates teacher, said to me, why don't you come to yoga, Kayla? And I was so resistive. I was like, (laughs) oh, no, I hate yoga. It's not for (laughs) me. And she's like, I think it'd be really good for you. I think she could see how neurotic maybe I was Mm -hmm. (laughs) as a young 19, uh, maybe 20-year-old at the time. Um, Just had a lot going on in my mind. (laughs) And it took her a little bit of kind of nurturing me to get into a yoga class and eventually I went and still disliked it a lot (laughs) but there was this time just felt a little different there was just something in that class I I don't specifically remember a pivotal moment but I just remember there was a feeling of feeling at home Mm -hmm. and even though I felt you know I literally would lie in shavasana I couldn't shut my eyes my nervous system was just so wired and active that my eyes would literally be flickering and so I invested in an eye pillow (laughs) just to like pin my eyelids down because yeah. I was just so active and reactive internally um and then just one day just something softened and I think there were so many moments on my mat that my teacher shared philosophy or shared something about yoga it didn't even necessarily have to be about yoga it was just something that was inspiring that I was like there's real beauty in this and I, I don't know what it is about this practice but I need to do more of it and 
at the time I was nursing, working casually. So I kind of worked everywhere, mostly in emergency and mostly in mental health was kind of like the two main areas. But I basically used my yoga and Pilates studio as my place or my outlet to go either before or after work. And it, it pretty much became like six days a week. I was regularly doing two classes a day because it just felt so liberating to move my body, especially in the dancing industry. It can be very rigid and harsh. And I just felt there was this freedom of movement that I just didn't get to explore in those younger days, particularly in ballet. It's very rigid. Um, So yeah, I fell in love with yoga and Pilates and um, it really became this anchor for me, particularly working in the hospital was quite taxing on my nervous system, particularly in emergency mental health. They're both pretty high energy areas. And um, yeah, it just felt like a homecoming and I'm still coming home every time I arrive on my mat. I'm just in awe of the beauty of the practice. And I really look at it as this, but I kind of look at yoga for my mind um, Mm. and Pilates for my physical body. Mm. And I use them both very medicinally in that, medicinally in that way um and I kind of think like Pilates for me brings me so much joy and lightheartedness and yoga still there's joy and lightheartedness but it's a little bit more um of a spiritual practice for me and I yeah yeah, there's a depth to that where I really feel that I meet myself time and time again Mm. and many layers of myself on the mat and Mm. yeah I love that. Like I actually did ballet growing up as well, like for many years. And even that thing you speak of, like when you step onto your mat, like whether it's Pilates or or bar or or yoga, I I almost feel like that we used to have that experience of like when you'd place your hand on the bar, like when you'd stand like at the beginning of class, it was like that coming back to like this version of like Mm. you that felt, even though it was very (laughs) structured and rigid and like you must be tucked in in a certain way and stuff, which probably created some bad habits in the long run. (laughs) But there's that, it it carries that same energy of like Mm. coming back to yourself. It just, you just reminded me of that in in the way that you described that. I saw, could see the similarity. Definitely. And I mean, for me, like even I remember working in the hospital you just can't take that away from yourself. Like I'd be at patients' bedsides doing like little calf raises and I'd have (laughs) my feet in like the first position and like my colleagues would be like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. There's just this drive in me to want to move my body. And I lost that from about 16 to probably 20. Yeah. Um, And once you step back into that, like, I don't know, it's just such a liberating feeling. And, yeah, I I have no... um, negativity about the ballet industry it's beautiful and it's such an art but definitely I agree with what you've said of there is a sense of rigidity in it and I find you know as an adult on a Pilates mat or a yoga mat there's a lot more freedom and oh it's an expression and actually my husband said to me one day he's like watching you do yoga Kayla feels very theatrical and I was like (laughs) that's how I want to move and he's like yeah but like you're so expressive in your movement and I'm like yeah, but that to me feels so in alignment True. with myself. Yeah. Like I'm not going to be rigid just because that's <laughs> what you want me to look yeah. like. Yeah. Like, mm. <laughs> is your partner's a yoga teacher too? Isn't yeah, he? so he teaches yin, but yeah. his background um, for the past 12 years has been in kung fu. So he's oh, been wow. studying kung fu Martial under arts. a master for um, it's very lineage based, very traditional. Wow. Um, his grandmaster you know, studied at the Shaolin Temple and, um, yeah, it's very, very serious and wow. very different energy to yoga. Yeah. Um, we'll often say, you know, it's like kill or be killed. Like that's <laughs> what they're training for in a not literal way, but like they really quite, it's quite heavy contact and yeah. like, wow, like he'll come home like scratches on him. And wow. I'm like what happened? He's like, oh, it's just a finger mark. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> whereas yeah but he he's really drawn to yin because of the Taoism approach that yin embodies and uh, yeah there's a lot of Chinese philosophy in yeah. yin so he really resonates with that more so than more like a hatha or vinyasa yoga but yeah he's really big on meditation and mindfulness that's kind of his kind of goes hand in hand with that type of stuff yeah yeah, yeah. I love that 
And you recently went through a experience where you, I mean, you've been studying Vedic sort of principles for a mm. while and um, I love hearing you like mention the things in classes, but you came to a conclusion that um, you had made a choice that maybe you needed to reverse recently yeah. <laughs> based on, was it, you said that your Vedic kind of um, journey brought you to that to me the other day. Yeah. So there was, there was many points that brought me to that. Of mm. course, I think the universe is constantly guiding you and giving you little tickles like, Hey, yeah. wake up. Yeah. And we ignore those tickles often until we get a bit more of a brick thrown at you and you're like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe going to listen. Yeah, not always. Sometimes it's a bigger event again. But um, yeah. So I had breast implants that I got put in as I was twenty. Actually, it was just right before I started my yoga journey. Mm. So maybe a couple of months before getting like got them in, and then a couple of months later, I found yoga. And at, you know, at the time, it was just from a deep place of lack. It was. I remember my boyfriend at the time. He actually was so for it and it was quite a very toxic relationship mm. and to the point where, you know, he very much manipulated me into getting them and actually paid for some of the surgery. It was very much wow. a part of something that he wanted. I mean, I wanted them. I remember saying to my mum when I was 16, like, mum, when am I going to get boobs? Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, honey, I don't think you will. Well, <laughs> just, just deal with it. And I, I was on... I think birth control from when I was about 15 and literally because I wanted boobs, not because I was sexually active. <laughs> and I went on about four to five different ones. Wow. Being like, I don't understand doctor. Like my boobs still haven't grown. <laughs> and he's like, I don't know, love, it's just not for you. <laughs> but so I was very like sure from a young yeah. age that I was going to get them, but definitely this relationship um, held space for that decision. I, I probably wouldn't have made that decision purely on my own. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I got them in. And um, to be honest, I was so much shame when I first got them in. I remember because my boyfriend had influenced me so much, I ended up getting these really high profile ones that were really round. And I mean, when you first get them in, they look ridiculous. Like, they yeah, have to, they have to drop or something. Years before like, they settled and I was like, oh, okay, this feels natural now ish. But I was really ashamed and I used to cover them up a lot. And yeah, um, yeah I was really ashamed. And to the point, you know, my, my first boyfriend actually, the first thing I remember him saying to me when I woke up was, Oh, I thought they were going to be bigger. Um, oh and gosh. the surgeon said, Well, this is all we could fit. Like, Kayla has a really narrow chest wall. Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, Oh, well, that's okay. Once it stretches, we can you can get them done again so like what? he was heavily influencing wow. my decisions by this point and um straight after I got them in and I only really clicked to this recently um I broke out in massive like head to toe eczema like to the mm -hmm. point where I would literally have to wrap myself with glad wrap and steroid creams wow. I would take an antihistamine every night or every day have nasal sprays um the glad wrap was so I wouldn't scratch it because mm -hmm. I would literally wake up, the sheets would be covered in blood. I remember at this one distinct moment where um, my boyfriend was literally holding my arms down and sitting on top of me and I was kicking, like, because I was so itchy. Yeah. I was screaming, crying, just, like, wanting to scratch myself basically till I would bleed and he was like, well, you can't. Yeah. So um, that came on and off and then I started doing yoga and, there was a massive change to my diet and mm -hmm. my mindset and nervous system. So it settled a bit, but there was also this period where I had, um, I think I was about 22 for about 12 months straight. My eye just watered wow. <laughs> like, to the point where the doctor had actually referred me to an ophthalmologist and I was on a wait list for like 12 months. Um, and they were going to put Botox in my tear drops, I mean my tear ducts. So I couldn't, produce tears anymore because it oh was just so debilitating. Gosh. I just was so puffy in my face and just taking eye drops, antihistamines, nasal sprays like every day. And I just, at the time, just, you just would never identify that connection. And yeah, I can't say hundred percent that that was the reason, but I, I intuitively feel that that was a big part of it. And just along the, along the way, just dealing with a lot of different you know, digestive stuff. And that's really what led me to Ayurveda, actually. Um, I remember when I did my first yoga teacher training, we did a, a whole day on Ayurveda and 
he was like, oh, Ayurveda is all about digestion. And I was like, oh, because, you know, it wasn't until I became a nurse that I realized that you're like supposed to go to the bathroom every day mm-hmm. and that, you know, it's such a big part of your health. Whereas before that, I just had really, I've had a lifelong issues with digestion, mm-hmm. but it seemed to be getting worse despite me doing a lot of good things for mm-hmm. myself. And um, I would say probably the point, I came to, I I saw something on Instagram maybe about two years ago and I remember the moment because I'd seen something and then we were actually out at our wedding venue Mm. and um, I said to my husband like, oh, I saw this girl posted about breast implant illness and she was sharing about all the symptoms and it was, you know, like brain fog, palpitations, memory loss, fatigue, you know, all the classic kind of autoimmune, but just it it could have been really anything, anything because they're all such blanket symptoms Mm -hmm. for basically, it was about 40 different symptoms when I Googled it and I was like, oh, I think I got like 20 of these symptoms out of the 40 and a big part of like my dismissal of looking further into it was I partly denial. Like I was like, I don't want to actually, I lo- I really liked my boobs. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I don't want to have to lean into it more because then I'm going to have to get them out. And then I'm, I-, I had this really big fear that I was not going to in- like the look of myself after. Yeah. I guess because the reason I got them in came from such a subconscious mm-hmm plates of black that I, w- I was kind of like oh, I, I I don't know if I'm going to be able to live with like the the ramifications yeah. after and in my mind I kind of created this whole thing that I was going to have just this big skin sagging <laughs> off my chest and but it's not the case I was very happy <laughs> but, but I um, guess you'd work through like a level of shame and now you were feeling yeah, empowered by them and yeah. then it was like oh wait I don't want to take that away from myself yeah, again yeah I felt so confident in myself and I realized now I'm like that confidence wasn't actually the boobs no. like that was myself yeah <laughs> if anything like I would actually hide them still yeah. and like it impacted my posture and yeah um but yeah I remember saying because we were out in Kenilworth and I was like oh I'm, I saw this thing and um at you know we were saving for a wedding and we were talking about buying a house and I looked into it and it was about nine grand to get them out and I was like oh I just don't know if I can not, not that Paul would have not supported the decision, but I was, I didn't want to put that on him of like, oh, let's use our savings to have this surgery that in his mind he didn't really see the relevance at that point. He was mm-hmm. kind of like, okay, well, those symptoms could be anything. Like yeah. it's probably not related. Mm-hmm. Now he's like, oh, my God, you, I'm so glad you did that. But yeah. So it took me probably, yeah, two, year, two years to get that to, to the next point where I was starting to feel quite, fatigued um I was having severe palpitations I mm-hmm. couldn't even walk up the stairs to go to the studio I would get to the top of the stairs and literally like almost sometimes like stop and hold the wall and have to like mm-hmm. but I think a part of that shortness of breath was really coming from I was so constricted around my chest and my diaphragm couldn't expand properly like every time mm-hmm. I would take a deep breath I would literally feel like a shudder happening in my diaphragm and it it was like the energy just couldn't move up mm-hmm. it would just kind of dissipate out um so it's kind of having these like ongoing things and I was starting to get a bit frustrated because I was like I, I've done so much for myself in my healing journey I'm you know seeing an acupuncturist weekly I see kinesiologists mm-hmm. regularly I take my herbs I eat good food I do yoga I do pilates I meditate I you know drink a lot of water you yeah. have your green smoothies too yeah, I, was really <laughs> I was like what's yeah. going on um and kind of feeling a bit disempowered as well because I actually got to the point where I couldn't really do much yoga or Pilates yeah. because I was getting so short of breath. Yeah. Um, I just felt like I couldn't breathe and it was actually causing like a panic within me. So we'd actually decided that in June we were going to try to conceive and um, it had been like a year-long conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think, I can't remember, it was like April or May, I woke up one morning and I was just like, Paul, I need to have my breast implants out. And he was like, oh, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I've got to do it. And yeah. especially like I've just decided it's like, it was just like my body was just like enough, like yeah. get them out. <laughs> and um, he was like, okay, like I'll support whatever you want to do. He's very good like that. But um, your spirit I, baby was talking through yeah, you too. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, I'd spoken to, you know, clairvoyance about my spirit baby and um, 
was told by like three different people that this spirit wanted to come through in June. So I had a very much an attachment to June being mm-hmm. the time that this spirit baby was going to enter the world mm-hmm. and very much wanted that to be the time, like because we kind of we got married in October of the year before and mm-hmm. we said, look, we'll give it about eight months to just enjoy each other's company. And <laughs> yeah. And then um I just thought I could ring up a surgeon in the next day pretty much have the <laughs> surgery. <laughs> And um, it wasn't the case. I rang so many people and I couldn't get in for like six months. And I was like on the phone to these receptionists, the poor ladies being like, you don't understand. Like I need to be pregnant in two months. I My spirit baby wants to come I in. Did. I told one lady, I was like, I'm getting pregnant in June. She's like, oh, well, I'm so sorry. But like, and so I rang multiple places and the soonest I could get in, was like a, an appointment and it was in July. And I think originally the appointment was like October and I would ring once a week and be like, is there a sooner appointment for me? And she was just like, hi, Kayla. Oh, no, not at this point. And then I made this really clear intention because I was getting a bit like, oh, should I just fall pregnant? And like, yeah. I was kind of like in this limbo of like, maybe I'm just being a bit um, neurotic about this whole thing. It's probably not even the reason I'm feeling so crap maybe I'll just get pregnant which is definitely wasn't the case yeah (laughs) and um so I made this intention like I'm calling this lady and she's going to have an appointment for me next week and I sat and meditated on that intention (laughs) and I rang her and I was like hi me again um any appointments (laughs) coming up soon like I really want these things out she was like you'll never believe it. We I just got off the phone to someone. She's cancelled and I've got an appointment next Friday. Would you like it? I'm like, yes, <laughs> So, and then if from there, it was another six weeks again till I had to the wait surgery. until I have the surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Which isn't too bad, to be honest. It's like not, if, considering you were going to have to wait six months yeah. for an appointment to begin with, like six week turnaround after he must have had some space in his calendar. <laughs> yeah, like it wasn't in the scheme of things. Yeah. Like, and I was so, I was like yeah. calculating the dates. Like this is past June. Like, and then I got really upset and I was like, my spirit baby must have really wanted that star sign and I stuffed it up for them like and I was like Kayla you're probably going way too deep into this (laughs) the spirit baby will come when it comes yeah um so I just had to surrender all of that um yeah and had the surgery and it was funny even before having the surgery I had to get a referral from a GP yeah and one of the first things that he said to me was are you gonna get another one in and I was like, well, no, the whole reason I'm getting them out is because I truly believe they're causing me like all these inflammation problems and yeah. all the new type things are happening. And I think that's the cause. Like, why would I get, and I was so like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and um, he was like, oh, well, I know a lot of women that have had them out and feel really self-conscious after. And I, I lost it. I was like, well, I'm very happy with my decision. Thank you. Like, yeah. I, the reason I'm getting them out is because I feel good about myself and I don't need them anymore. I don't need implants to feel good about myself. I was like, felt like I probably projected my frustration for my boyfriend. (laughs) I feel like it would have shown up for that reason. Like, are you going to stand up for yourself? Yeah. And you did. I was like, no, like I'm not getting another pair put in. And the surgeon, the same thing. He was like, look, a lot of women get them in. And, And then I said, no. And he was like, well, would you like a fat graft? And I was like, oh, tempting. <laughs> no, like that's just the same thing. Like, yeah. Just if I do that, although, yes, I'd love for you to take some mm. thigh fat and put it in my <laughs> boobs, but no, like. Stop manipulating yeah, this like, beautiful no, body. I just want to be my normal self. Mm, and I, yeah. I kept saying that, I'm like, I just want to be my natural self. Like why is this so hard for everyone to understand? Mm. And I, like, I was really lucky the surgeon I had, um, and this was why I ended up going with him, he um, is actually researching breast implant illness. Wow. So that was a big decision for me to choose him. Mm-hmm. That. Um, and he was, you know, this is his livelihood. He's not going to go and say, oh, yes, breast implants are causing all these women illness. But he was very open-minded at mm-hmm. least, and he, he listened and he held space, whereas I feel like a lot of women that I've, met have been gaslit and just told mm. no like there's no way that that could be an issue it's just in your head and even now like only just a couple of weeks ago the FDA actually just brought out um 
they've just confirmed that breast implants now have to have a black box warning on them and all surgeons have to inform women of the potential side effects of breast implant illness. So I was like, what a win for women. Like, wow. this is amazing. And it's not just implants. It's, you know, Botox has all the same mm-hmm. toxins and stuff and um, fillers and stuff. Like, it's all the same kind of lens. It's like, yeah. Uh, it's been really interesting just to be like, wow, we are so freaking beautiful. We're made yeah. exactly as God intended to make us. And the ego or our influence of the external world gets involved and we just want to change things. It's like <laughs> it's been a great journey because I actually love my new I keep calling them my new boobs, but they're like my old boobs. <laughs> they're beautiful. And I feel so confident. Yeah. I'm like I'm like, wow, I'm actually I'm amazing. Yeah, yeah. I tell my husband all the time, I'm like, feel them, Paul. Like, they're so <laughs> soft. <laughs> breast implants are really hard. Yeah. Um, he's like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel now? Like, what are the biggest differences you notice? Like, have all those symptoms disappeared? Not all. I would say I'm the biggest thing immediately that I noticed, I remember as soon as I opened my eyes, I just took a deep breath and the first, Thing that I thought was wow I can breathe yeah and god knows how long I'd had that I guess um what I'm looking for like restrictive breath pattern or dysfunctional breath pattern mm. for, probably since they've been in and mm-hmm. I just haven't really noticed mm. maybe I don't know like <laughs> yeah maybe not fully noticed it but um definitely the ability to breathe um I've stopped getting these like shortness of breath episodes just even teaching I don't know if you may have noticed sometimes I'd be teaching and I'd have to almost stop and be like <gasps> yeah and I've noticed you've been taking more, way more classes of other people yeah, as well it's I've like ooh, Kayla's in my class today <laughs> I had energy mm. to actually go and be a student again because I felt Im- I felt embarrassed almost because mm. like I'm the owner of this studio and I'm tapping out every five minutes because I don't have the energy or the stamina yeah. or I can't breathe um, and I feel like crap. Mm-hmm. And I isolated myself actually a lot for probably the last six months. I really was like, I don't want to do anything. I don't Yeah. A lot of shame, but even yeah. around like, why did I do this to myself? Like, mm-hmm. but um, the things like, you know, I've had blood tests and everything and um, there's a few like obvious things like my thyroid was quite low and my iron was quite low. Mm. And one of the side effects of breast implant illness can be leaky gut syndrome mm-hmm. um, and obviously just not absorbing nutrition properly. So it'll be interesting to see, obviously that's going to be a bit more of a, a longer term thing. Mm. It's not an overnight, my gut lining is going to mm. heal itself. So I've been doing a lot of protocols, um, seeing a naturopath and um, have just had another blood test and, um, thyroid function I'm not sure we'll see how that goes but I I do think those things will start to improve Um, Mm -hmm. memory has been I was actually teaching classes and forgetting like I can't remember what I just taught (laughs) and I was so humiliated because I'd be like oh my god people are gonna think like I'm an idiot because I would literally every single class I taught I'd be forgetting something and I'd be like with me. me and Laura like we haven't done this <laughs> no, literally like I would have yourself or students be like Kayla we forgot this thing and I'd be like oh that's right and everyone else is like cursing us why did you yes. remind us we have to do the other side yes. so I that's significantly improved I feel like my memory one of the really interesting things actually um I when I got them out I noticed straight away I was having dreams and I wow. never really ever recall having dreams yeah and straight away and any if I did have a dream it was very erratic it was like my gosh like and then suddenly you were there and then we were at the park and then like somehow we're at Disneyland like it was just really weird me no no (laughs) (laughs) I'm like you would have told me that (laughs) yeah makes sense whereas as soon as I got them out I was having these really clear-minded dreams that made sense and I felt like I was getting messages from my dreams yeah so even that ability to I guess connect with we well, dream from the womb, so it was like yeah. almost like there was something in the way well, before. There was. It was just I physically felt like there was a lump of silicon. Yeah, <laughs> there was. Yeah, like, I just could not 
explain the feeling of having them there and they didn't feel like that right from the start I yeah. think that was like another great point to raise like it wasn't like it was like a slower onset yeah it was like a slow burn <laughs> I had them in for 10 years so wow. nine years not a bit so so who knows how long that'll take to fully like neutralize yeah, as well and I'm, I'm pretty okay that it's going to be a slow journey I'm, yeah. I'm not like okay tomorrow I have to feel better I'm like you know what just that was a long time to put that stress in your body. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting, the um, surgeon, because he is doing the research mm. and I'm a part of, he was like, would you like to be a study participant? I was like, with pleasure. Like, yeah. How exciting. If I could help be a part of a study that helps other people, mm-hmm. that would be a dream. So, um, yeah, he sent the capsules, like, because around the implant, basically your body forms a connective tissue capsule, which mm-hmm. basically it encases it like a tumour. It's like, oh, my God, what is this foreign thing mm-hmm. inside of me? So um, depending on how much your body doesn't like it, it can be, like, very thin or it can be extreme. I've seen pictures of, mm-hmm. like, centimetres thick of, yeah. like, just It looks hard. like almost like plaque kind of material, yeah, it doesn't it? It's, yeah. It's, yeah, so he sent that away um, and it had cysts, fibroids and chronic inflammation in the tissue. Wow. So I just feel so blessed that I listened to that intuition to get them out um, because, for, you know, all I know that could have turned into a cancer. It still could, like, who knows? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not putting that energy out into the world. No, <laughs> just keep sending the energy to your past self saying, yeah. get them out, get them out. Mm-hmm. Alex and I talk about that, I think, and on our last podcast of like mm. sending energy to your past self like so you follow your intuition more yeah and I mean like the intuition's always there it's just clouded by the external stuff and mm-hmm. for me I, I think I literally had a real block physically in my yeah. system it's like my body was trying to communicate with me all the time but I was literally blocked yeah but at least it helped you find like a vader in a way because you said that that was like during that journey wasn't it yeah so it's interesting one of my so in my studies we had a teacher um she's a osteopath and she's from LA and I remember this is actually a part of where it maybe like the first little seed I was like (gasps) Um, (laughs) she was saying that as we were doing a lecture it was um something about like the nervous system and the body Mm -hmm. In, in essence I can't call, but um she was saying about there's trauma in the body actually so it's mm. about physical traumas on the body and how that affects our nervous system yeah and she gave was giving all these different examples of stuff but then she said you know like I work in LA and like pretty much 90% of my clients have breast implants and she's like where the excision is made which is below the breast fold at the front of your chest it's right next to your sympathetic nervous system Mm -hmm. she said something that I've noted in pretty much all women that have had implants that are my clients is that they've got anxiety they've got digestive issues they're having heart palpitations Mm -hmm. and they can't breathe yeah (laughs) and she's like even just one of those things starts to throw out the rest of the nervous system in the body but she was saying that because they're cutting and making a trauma and then there's you know connective tissue rebuilding around the nerve endings of the sympathetic nervous system that she's made this real correlation to that and that was another big symptom I was having like a lot of anxiety but not mentally anxious just physical that feeling in my diaphragm like it was just pulsating all the time and like constricted like I just Mm -hmm. felt like I couldn't breathe and that's gone since having them out. Like I don't feel that jitter. anxious. Wow. Were you pinning that down to like your Avedic type? When yeah, you... well, I'm super Vata and I don't know if you know much about the doshas. I'd love you explain it because I don't know <laughs> off the top of my head very well. So in Ayurveda, it's basically um, in a roundabout way, it's the sister science of yoga. Yeah. It's more about purifying the body and it's more about health so yoga is more about the mind and you know there's many different tools and practices and techniques to help awaken the mind but if you've got stagnation or 
digestive issues or physical stuff happening in the body, it's very hard to become liberated from that. Mm. that I mean, it's possible, definitely you can. However, it's going to be a really long probably journey and it's going to require a lot of tenacity and grit to overcome those obstacles. Whereas Ayurveda is basically designed to work alongside yoga Mm -hmm. and there's a whole system, there's a whole science within the Vedic system, which is Ayurveda, yoga, tantra, mantra, um, Jyotish, which is like Vedic astrology. Um, So like there's something else that's not coming to me at the moment. But basically they're all designed to work together. And if you're practising yoga, traditionally you'd be looking at all of these things as an one embodied type thing of course modern yoga has become very much just a physical practice and mm-hmm. a lot of studios I feel don't touch on the depth of what yoga could offer and I really feel that the studio is very much trying our best to share mm. a deeper lens of yoga in um, a way that's relatable to the everyday person yeah. and uh, you know if they want to learn more then you know we run workshops and stuff and they can dive a bit deeper but um I definitely agree. Like the philosophy that you guys share, like has made me stick true to yoga when maybe in the past I've not been able to stick to it as much. And now I'm like at the point where I'm like, I want to learn this deeper. Yeah. And I mean, in, I think I can't remember. So there's a lot of Vedic texts and they're very um, unrelatable. (laughs) You go to read them. You're like, what? (laughs) Basically I like any, any of the Vedic teachings were traditionally oral traditions. So Mm -hmm. The way that it's written, it's like translated in a certain way, but it requires a teacher to dive deeper and understand it yeah. for you, basically, or help you see a little bit. The integration. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think it was the Truka Samhita, but it says that Ayurveda should be shared for the right time, place, circumstance, and the group of people in front of you. And I really take that teaching so literal because we do live in a modern world and people do want into some degree to come into a physical yoga practice. That's what people's expectation is (laughs) for sure. Um, And I always think if you can give people a bit of what they want and sprinkle in what you think they may need, and that's hard because I'm (laughs) about to explain the doshas, which is basically our mind and body types according to Ayurveda and they're extremely different like so vast that it's like yeah how do you have a room of 20 people and meet everyone's needs you can't so Mm -hmm. um I but I always think if I can at least translate the teachings to be relevant I mean there's a lot of really dogmatic ways of sharing yoga Mm. righteous ways of sharing yoga and Modern yoga gets a bit of a bad rap in the yoga industry sometimes. There's some really righteous teachers out there that are um, very much into the philosophy and the sacredness of that, and I believe wholeheartedly in that, but I also believe in making it digestible and relevant to the people in front of you because you want them to come back. And you want more people to experience <laughs> you yoga. Want them to have an experience that in some way awakens something physically in them that then gives them the chance to Explore. potentially contemplate. And it might take step. them nine, ten years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, but one day, you never know. <laughs> absolutely. I remember there was a teacher of mine, she was talking about um, something about food. Yeah. And I think it came to the, the teaching of Himsa, which is nonviolence. Yeah. Um, and basically this is like one of the first protocols of yoga is like mm-hmm. if you're not practising Himsa, then stuff doing the sun salutations yeah. Yeah. or going to meditation like if you're loathing on other people <laughs> yeah. or criticizing or judging or doing harm to the world or the environment then you're not in line with yoga and mm. anything you, you do beyond that is going to just keep spiraling you further away from your center so himza is this beautiful teaching and i remember my teacher was saying something about it. i can't remember exactly what but just something about food and the way we eat, and she was referring to it in, you know, himza is not just external, although that's traditionally how it was taught, it's the way that we treat ourselves and it's the way that we feed ourselves and, you know, mm. you know doing your best to hydrate. And she just made these really practical, relatable teachings that were everyday kind of things that we all kind of know. But it was something that so simple in what she said that I was like, 
I'm going to stop going and getting fish and chips after yoga. Because my <laughs> little thing, I after would, yoga. <laughs> <laughs> that was like my thing. I was so um, still integrating eating a healthier diet at this yeah. point. Yeah, and like, that was like your treat. Yeah, I loved fish and chips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, she said something along those lines that just inspired me. And I was like, if you can get people in an open and receptive space physically, and teach them something that's relevant to them, but also in the lens of the yoga philosophy. I think that's where people land the most. If I'm, I, I can cite a lot of the scriptures and go down deeper texts, but and speak Sanskrit. But it's like ninety mm-hmm. percent of the class is like, "What is she talking about?" And they <laughs> they go off. They don't listen. Then yeah. their mind gets in the way. It's busy. Um, yeah, like I have just got distracted, and I was talking about the doshas. <laughs> so I will come back to the doshas. But the point is, there's so much depth to yoga. Yeah, and then there's so much depth to Ayurveda, and I do believe they are so entwined. And yeah. Modern yoga really forgot about Ayurveda and I think that's a big passion of mine is to bring them back into heart. They're, they're sisters. They're supposed yeah. to be together. <laughs> oh, I love family. that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I remember my first teacher training, I did do like a day of Ayurveda. But it's not enough. Like, yeah. There's so much to it. So basically the doshas, you could say they're your mind-body type. Yeah. And so we have vata which is air and space, and the qualities of butter are mobile, fast, active, cold, rough, dry, <laughs> um, like very erratic. If you think of air and the wind mm-hmm. and space, it's got no, they don't have a lot of substance to them. Mm-hmm. Um, so you might notice these types of people, I am one of them, um, <laughs> will probably speak with a higher pitched voice. They'll probably change their tune quite quickly because they'll be so excited and they'll lose track it's kind of like if you think of a windy day where things are just being blown everywhere and yeah. their brains are very active and almost hypervigilant in a sense um because there's so much energy moving up so vata is the most subtlest element like the subtlest of the elements is air and space so there's not a lot keeping vata people grounded mm-hmm. yeah and we we all have all three of these doshas within us we just have what we call our prakriti, which is our most natural state, our most dominant state. But then we um, develop a vikriti, which is where we go out of balance. Vikriti is who we are when we're born and what we're kind of in, the the divine's intention with us. (laughs) And then we, 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 life happens and that goes out of balance. So lots of people are very airy, very spacey, um, charismatic people. Um, funny, often intelligent, very witty type person. Um, one thing that they lack is probably groundedness. One big quality of a butter type person would be creativity. Um, and very like you'll know when you're around a butter person because they've got so much zest for life. They're very excited about everything. Mm. Um, to look at a butter person, they've generally got like longer limbs, longer mm. fingers frizzy hair <laughs> She's probably looking at me just thinking, oh my god well, I was thinking myself so and I was thinking me but then when you said frizzy hair I'm like oh, I don't have frizzy hair but <laughs> we could also be that straight yeah thin anything to do with vata is inconsistent right so you could look at someone's nails like look at my nails this one's really short this one's round this one's square <laughs> like, a little bit of chaos yes, going on chaos is probably mm. the perfect word for it um and if you think of those qualities dry rough cold so prone towards like constipation dry skin um being whole all the time um but that there's some of the obviously negative qualities (laughs) of vata um the positive are you know creative inspired Mm. energetic light kind of etheric people um very connected to spirit because Mm. they're subtle so there's not a lot keeping them on the earth um and we're often dual constitutions. So mm-hmm. then we have pitta, which is fire um, and water. Pitta people are, you know, the qualities of pitta are like intense, sharp, mobile, oily, quick, like so hot. Like you can think type A personality type people mm. probably working in corporations mm. or owning their own business. Like in the structure. Yeah, very much um, 
so like a vata person will have a lot of like long like you might see a lot like longer facial features mm. um pitta people are quite angular mm. so um they'll be quite, very even <laughs> like symmetrical oh, yeah everything's very intentional because it's like so much just mm-hmm. uh, like structure into what they're doing yeah. basically um can be intense can be very passionate very fiery um often burn themselves out very quickly um you know well maybe i'm this yeah, totally <laughs> so I'm, my sister and i would be a combination of both of these yeah. i feel so i'm predominantly vata pitta yeah so if, if i was to break it down i've probably got about 40 percent vata 30 percent pitta and about 20 percent so I, like, yeah because you have them all got a bit of every ratio it's just yeah. about understanding what your primary constitution is yeah or what you tend to lean into yeah yeah because if you've got more butter that's where you're going to go out of balance the most because yeah like attracts like and this is like such a common saying in ayurveda is you're going to get drawn and it's easy it's like if i i'm light i'm going to get pulled into these like yeah and like yeah, so pitta is more um, like digestively. You might be very regular, mm-hmm. very on on time. Like everything about pitta is like think of like a CEO. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's how the body kind of holds pitta. Yeah. It's like very regular in digestion. If it if out of balance, it could be like really, just move through really quickly and probably like quite intensely. Yeah. Um, they'll be hot like all mm-hmm. the time mm-hmm. even have like redder tones in their skin or mm. hair um paler skin often mm. um yeah so pitta people are very passionate mm. probably have many projects on the go <laughs> um their mind is very sharp so they'll be very attentive very um mm. critical very in a sense judgmental mm. this is out of balance yeah. but when balance like super just onto it punctual um aware of everything that's going on has a great structure and can systematize things really well mm. um but when out of balance will be really intense, fiery, angry, like you think dominating, like yeah. taking over kind yeah, of thing. You think of fire, it's destructive. So yeah. Um, but there is a bit of water in there too with pitta. So there's still that little bit. It needs the water to, to soften cool it. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there's kapha. So kapha is earth and water. Um, generally bigger boned. So you, like a butter person will have quite small, like wrists and joints like they'll be quite small mm. and um like light pitta will be a bit medium cuff will be bigger boned mm-hmm. generally have more muscular structure to them it could also be that they carry more fat tissue mm-hmm. and not in a way that they're overweight but they just hold more mm-hmm. of that um think of really it's got earth like they're earthy people mm-hmm. you'll notice their tone in their voice is very like sold to the earth type people mm. very grounded mm. um the qualities are like um again like heavy dense cool sluggish yeah so, can, so like a depressiveness that comes out it can up? be for yeah. sure um so often these people I kind of think of cuff, and this is more of an imbalance cover, like Eeyore. Oh, <laughs> like that really. Well, that like, is depression, yeah, isn't it? Like really like, oh, yeah. like melancholy. What's that word? Melancholy. Melancholy. Yeah, like a bit, can be a bit heavy, slower to talk. Like a vata person, like, oh my God. Oh, and people yeah. be very sharp with their words. And, and so you can kind of notice it when you're going through those yeah, things. Yeah, getting denser and denser each time. Um, yeah when in balance like very nurturing very caring thing mm. like mother nature mm-hmm. like that kind of energy the that, earthy yeah, yeah just super grounded super um connected to other people mm. uh, when out of balance can just be super sluggish depressed really tired like they're, they're often like i've got a friend that's very kapha based and she sleeps until like 10 a.m most days and i'm like what do you mean like, <laughs> she's like i just couldn't get up like but yeah. they can't like they're just if they're in balance but when balanced like there's such beautiful qualities yeah and like both vata and kapha can have depression yeah vata depression is very different to kapha depression yeah like a vata person will be just running so high all the time that yeah. 
the body intervenes and brings kapha into them to slow them down and basically ground them because they're mm-hmm. just can't sustain. It's just like, like that hyper vigilant so nervous yeah. system sort of yeah, energy. So they, they yeah, basically end into a collapse, whereas mm. a kapha is like that true, like a bit more clinical yeah. depression. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's so fascinating Ayurveda because, I mean, this is just the ice tip, not even <laughs> yeah. what it is. But really the whole concept is about inviting people to understand themselves deeper yeah. and to build a deeper relationship because the way that I am is so different to the way that my husband is. Mm-hmm. And even looking at the way that we eat, it's like, well, I need more earthy foods because I'm very vata but I also have a bit of pita so I do need to be mindful that I'm not over spicing and putting too much heat and intensity into my life Mm -hmm. I don't really like spicy food so I'm pretty good in that I'm Mm -hmm. more forceful lifestyle I'll I'll over intensify my life (laughs) I love doing everything (laughs) and then that's really heating for me and that's when I get a bit fiery and like God. too much yeah. um whereas you know my husband's got more pitta than his pitta butter so other way around yeah um so for him like I have to be mindful of like what I cook and the way that I cook but if if we had a, a kapha person in the family I they would need more spicing because they need something to yeah. keep them up and pull them out of that mud in a sense yeah. so it's very unique um it's really you know profound it's such an inquisitive science that it's just it's the oldest medicine in the world yeah by over five thousand years old and so a nice. lot of modern allopathic medicine is based off ayurveda mm-hmm. even a lot of tcm is based off ayurveda it is yeah, yeah. And they say everything has come from ayurveda yeah it has to be older than five thousand i sure. would say so that yeah. that's when they can date it back yeah to. so it's all interconnected and you know it, it just makes sense. Like really the concept is aligning more to your true nature. Yeah. Really is what you're looking to do. And I just think it's it's poetry. Like my Ayurvedic textbook compared to my nursing textbooks, nursing textbooks <laughs> like this is a red blood cell. And Ayurveda one's like the flowing body of blood that streams through your veins and like <laughs> to the source. I'm like, what? Like, it dances cry. through your system. I would literally <laughs> cry sometimes reading my textbooks I'm like this is like pure Beautiful. poetry whereas I was so used to this clinical yeah dry disconnected way of medicine that it just makes sense to me it's like oh. yeah it sounds like a more balanced like approach because like if we think of like allopathic medicine is almost like quite um left brain like in mm. the way that they go about things Definitely. and this feels like more of a combination of like the balance of both sides of the brain like there's structure there but Definitely. there's also that creative flow that comes through definitely and i mean like look you can be an ayurvedic surgeon so it's not just <laughs> that ayurveda doesn't fully go lefty <laughs> it's so vast that's okay. yeah like, there's some really deranged concepts where like i've heard of people in india where they were told to drink cat pee to like you know it was oh like you go God. from one end to the yeah. other like to feel with anything yeah. yeah so there's a lot of um far out stuff <laughs> in ayurveda that i'm kind of like oh god like, yeah but what interests me most of that is the psychology of ayurveda because it's really just about understanding yourself yeah and ayurveda would say that all illness begins in the mind mm-hmm. because if the mind is imbalanced you know, we then start to make choices in align with that imbalance Mm. and often those choices push us further out of balance and then over time the more we do that, the more the illness or toxicity can develop within the body. And But if we're balanced in our mind and we're not going to lean towards the things that will push, we're like, hang on, I don't need that chocolate right now. I actually (laughs) need to rest. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But... And it is interesting because Ayurveda works with the six tastes from each constitution yeah. has a taste that is mm-hmm. more supportive for them. Like, so, for example, vata people, the sweet taste is actually something that grounds a vata person because it invokes kapha in the system. Mm. And I always, when I'm feeling a bit fried, I'm like, I want sugar. Like, that's yeah. what I go for. And it's so fascinating So I'm like, that's my beautiful, intelligent body saying <laughs> to me. Kayla, 
slow down. Yeah. And I mean, we associate sweets with like sugar, but grains are sweet, fruit yeah. is sweet, root yeah. vegetables are sweet. So it's like if you can learn to give yourself actually what you need in your everyday diet. Yeah. You will know help it's just balance a huge that. difference in your whole mental state. Like mm. it's fascinating. And so what would Pitta and um, Kapha tend to like have the craving towards that would tell them that they're out of balance? Kapha people, they often crave sweets as well because they like yeah. to be staying to grounded, stay but they need the spice. More spice, yeah. yeah. And Pitta people need cooling. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, like your watermelons and like less spicing. Yeah. Like, oh, there's a lot of spicing in, in traditional Indian. And hydration is probably a really big thing yeah. for Pitta. Yeah. For, for Pitta people, it's like just pacifying the heat. For yeah. Butter people, it's like bringing in butter and kapha. Yeah. They need more warmth. So, yeah. Because vata is very dry, rough, and mobile, is like the qualities within them mm-hmm. that are called the subgunas. Um, you don't want to overspice because if it's already dry, if you think of when you get maybe like chapped lips from the wind, mm-hmm. it's already it's creating more your heat. eczema. <laughs> yeah, it's creating friction and heat. Yeah. So vatas will often have a really aggravated internal state because there's so much friction happening all the time. Yeah. The wind's constantly changing, yeah. and then yeah. it, that dryness creates heat Mm -hmm. whereas a kapha person they actually need more like a heated spice to actually pet them up so it's a it's a different way of looking at each dosha of like well if you're really imbalanced with vata i'm going to suggest you eat a lot of fruit vegetables and Mm. do yoga nidras and Mm. do abhyanga where you're rubbing oil on your skin Mm. every day to pacify that dryness Mm -hmm. and um get really good rest and stop doing things that Activate your mind because butter is really <laughs> governs the nervous system. So yeah. You know, anything butter is whatever that is moving. Mm-hmm. So it's like nervous system mm-hmm. constantly being affected by butter. Whereas half of people, I'd be like, you probably should go outside and go for a run. <laughs> but the half of people, like, you're not going to see them in the yoga classes often because you know, they've got a bit of picture in them, yeah. but they're too sluggish. They're like, I can't be bothered. They're on their couch. They always go in a yin if they do. Yeah, and I yeah. see so many people in yin and I'm like looking at them like, You're like are you kapha? You should come to the other class. <laughs> but same with like pitta and vata people will be so drawn to the yoga classes that will aggravate that within them. Like yeah. you see so many pitta people in a hot yoga class yeah which is the worst thing for them yeah it's fast it's intense it's hot there's this real competitive nature which is like such a quality of pitta people (laughs) to be so like just competitive and then you put them in that environment it's It's gonna like amplify like anything that is imbalanced will just be like lighting a match on them wow um and you see them I've seen so many people that I know that ex-colleagues that have hot yoga teachers mm. and I'm like you're spending your whole day in this hot yeah. environment it's like that's it's not, not good for you me. and same with like vata. it's only sustainable so long I guess yeah like a vata person in particular you will be super drawn to a really fast like vinyasa class because it's like up down well, yeah I don't have to spend any time with yeah. my emotions in yeah, their like, longer poses <laughs> like, where am I going next who knows like yeah. oh like that's so exciting for a vata person yeah. to see them like I see people all the time when I'm teaching they're fidgeting all the time and yeah they can't concentrate and you know we've just done one whole side of something and they're already like think they know what's happening next and then something <laughs> completely different and you're like okay that person's just vatted out over there like <laughs> The Peter person, like before you've even said it, they're in that posture, like they they know what's happening. And the Kapha person's in child's pose. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, it's so, it's, I really don't know which one's my main one after everything you've said. I have to so, I have to look it up. There's so figure. much to it. You can do an online yeah. quiz, but it's really the cusp of what it you know. Yeah, I need to learn more about it to understand. So, it. Basically, if you really want to know, you want to look at like your your teeth will tell you your your yeah. nose your face Body. your eyes yeah. um your skin tone yeah. your skin texture your pulse so there's so many things that you can like of a, course ayurvedic assessment would normally initially be about 90 minutes of just asking questions and getting yeah. information and that's before they've even told you anything they want you to do we'll Whereas, have to come and see you eventually yeah. <laughs> yeah. but like a, a quiz will give you a definite it's hard though because it'll be like 
you, you'll read into it as your current situation and often yeah sometimes you might be very balanced and yeah we think that that's who we really are but it's just a veil <laughs> yeah so yeah. true I've got some questions to ask okay you, Kayla what's your sun moon and rising signs we know your sun is Aquarius like yes. me what's your moon and rising my moon is Pisces and my rising is Cancer Oh my, yeah, it's all the wateriness. Is it, is it the same in your Vedic? No, so Ayurveda, the Vedic charts are quite different. Really, yeah. um, and I struggled with this when I first heard it <laughs> because I very much identify with being an Aquarius yeah. and have my whole life. And you'll regularly hear me say, it's because I'm an Aquarian. But yeah. I, like, I, I think I like hide behind that yeah. um, label. <laughs> um, so they say in the Joytish calendar that, um, the Western astrology hasn't compensated for a shift that's happened. Or a shift. Yeah, I've heard that. Um, so in my Vedic chart, I was a Capricorn sun, a Aquarian moon, Ooh. and a Gemini rising. I can see the Capricorn though, because I have a Capricorn moon, mm. and I could I could see the reflection of that in that possibility. Yeah. And so Ayurveda doesn't give a shit about your sun sign. And I was like really annoyed when I first heard that because again, I identify very much with being queer. Yeah. They care about your moon. So yeah. like, that's your personality. Like the well, sun then is Aquarius anyway. Yeah. And I was like, thank God. I'm still an Aquarius. <laughs> I've got to do mine and find it out. Do you know your human design? Yeah. And generator. Ah, that's why you keep going and going as well. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite fruit? Mango. Yeah. I love mango. I could eat mango every day. Me too. If you could return to one moment in your life and re-experience it again, what would you go back to? My wedding day, I feel like we planned four weddings with all of the COVID stuff. Oh, wow. We had a sick dog. She was being diagnosed with kidney failure. Yeah. And it was a bit of, you know, Paul's mum just got diagnosed with dementia. And it was a really, we just come out of three months of a lockdown with our studio and our nervous systems were pretty bright. Emotionally charged. By the yeah. time we got to our actual wedding day, like, I had this, I mean, we, we had to cut our wedding from 120 people to 35 wow. and um, none of our family could come other than our parents. And wow. um, yeah, like literally four weeks, four or five weeks before we got married, we completely cancelled our wedding and started from scratch. I just found this beautiful venue and rang them and was like, do you have this date available? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, great, I'm going to book that. And so like we lost a bit of money and stuff, but by the time we, got to the day like it was what it was meant to be right. just we were just both so active in our nervous systems mm. and it was just I ended up having because I did cancel everything had to organize a lot myself on the day and I just felt like I was although people were definitely helping I feel like you didn't get to fully like drop in to yeah, the I experience and, like, yeah it took me about five days like into our honeymoon you were very vata yeah, very, very, <laughs> I was just like I didn't even eat like on the day yeah. I was just starving I didn't even have a drink like Aww. I was so yeah uptight that like someone was like have a drink and I was like I can't like yeah <laughs> I just felt so wound up so it was a, still a beautiful day and we had the best ex- time but I would like to do it with more presence yeah <laughs> fair more enough <laughs> forest or the ocean Oh, I'm so I'm so torn because like my dream is to live in the forest on the ocean and I don't think that's a thing. <laughs> yeah. Find a spot. I'll come with you. <laughs> yeah, we currently live by the ocean. But, yeah. Um, we're very much looking towards migrating a little bit west, east, west, <laughs> west, west, yeah. Um, to a tree house. Yeah, yeah, we'd like to have a little bit of land, yeah. but also like we'd like to have a big. We this is our dream is to have a beach house that we like Airbnb and then have mm. our family home. It's a good. It's a good investment Airbnb. Yeah. yeah, you earn more money than investment property. It's just less um stable. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> Plant or flower that you work with the most? Do you have one? Mm. Or connect with the most? Probably the sunflower. <laughs> oh, I love it. But I don't like just because I love how they have to look at each other. Yeah, yeah. It's so bright and radiant, the sunflower. Yeah. Just love it. But also rose, that's my middle name. Oh, yeah. so beautiful. Actually, probably more rose. Like I sprinkle roses in everything. Can I drink a lot of rose medicine. tea? And I'm constantly bathing with roses around me. So probably more a rose. But I do love the vibrancy of a sunflower. <laughs> I love it. I almost made a rose tea right before you came and then I got distracted. Yeah. So that's funny. Yeah, <laughs> I was feeling you. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's your favorite crystal? Amethyst, but that's 
your pretty birthstone. Obvious because it's my birthstone. <laughs> Doesn't have to be. <laughs> Do you have a spirit animal, or if you're an animal, what would you be? Um, my spirit totem is an eagle. Mm. Yeah. And would you be an eagle if you're an animal? Probably not. I'd probably be a dog. I feel like dogs just have the best life. <laughs> if I was my dog, like yeah, <laughs> not all dogs, but like my dog is so spoiled. Just do a body swap for a day. Yeah. Well, someone told me. Um, we have an animal naturopath that yeah. we see, and um, she was telling me that apparently people like people perceive dogs as in the two dimensional. And I was like, there is oh. no way that my dog is stuck in the two D. Like, <laughs> she's a five D dog for sure. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. So if people want to get in touch with you or if they want to come to classes, you've got classes yeah. up here in the Sunshine Coast. Mm. Do you have any online offerings as well or is it all just here in the sunny coast? Um, we do have an online studio. It's definitely not something I've put energy into um, beyond just doing the COVID stuff, but yeah. um, it's available. People can definitely use that. So it's morning light at home dot com dot au um studio definitely you'll find me there probably nearly every day yeah <laughs> even on my days off i'll be there just practicing myself or just hanging out um yeah. morning light studio is our business um i don't have a personal website at this point i actually took it down i just felt like i was spreading myself in too many directions yeah and- I was like, that's too much. But my Instagram is probably where you would find me the most, where you would see lots of dog videos, <laughs> inspirational quotes probably. <laughs> yeah, and even sharing some of the breast implant um, disease stuff. I've seen you yeah. share a bunch of those yeah. things. Yeah, for sure. So Kayla's underscore wholesome life is where you'll find me. I'll um, put it in the notes as well. But, yeah, I'm, I'm in the current process of um, – putting together some Ayurvedic workshops and more around, I guess my journey really has been as a Vata person (laughs) with a lot of anxiety and overwhelm and um, yoga has really been such a a medicine and a healing for me. So putting together hopefully early next year um, some workshops around just the basics of Ayurveda, I guess, help people understand themselves a bit deeper because I think that's what Ayurveda can really offer people just to explore more about themselves because it makes so much sense and I I, Mm. I understand so much about my friends and I I can really hold compassion for other people because you're like oh well it's kind of a part of like their makeup (laughs) and they're different to me and that's okay um so definitely we'll be putting together some workshops around that but also um particularly around like anxiety and yeah. how you're going to be to work with those more on a therapeutic mm, level. Beautiful. Um, but yes, classes I'm, I teach most days pretty much. Yeah. And her classes are, your classes are amazing. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm coming to athletic reformer in the morning and I'm already regretting it. Oh, <laughs> oh. I was so sore after last week. I find it so funny because like, I do feel like my yoga, I really try to offer this depth of you know a relatable depth for people as I said before I'm not on my high horse preaching all these philosophies that people it's aren't very going to resonate with but yeah. um then I teach Pilates and I'm like get it girl <laughs> <laughs> like it's just a, such a different energy but I just love them both so much and I do often like reflect I'm like who am I a multifaceted <laughs> like, yeah and I am I'm just so multi like multi-dimensional I have so many yeah. passions and I'm forever studying something and like I'm really passionate even about Chinese medicine I'm like okay hey, that's too many modalities <laughs> stop like I have to always rein it in but yeah I definitely have these two personalities when I teach <laughs> I love it it's still you though of course <laughs> at the end of the day the one's more light-hearted one's a bit more <laughs> grounded <laughs> yeah yeah it's funny someone said to me the other day actually you're the most grounded person I've ever met. I was like, it, what? <laughs> you have not seen a glimpse into my mind. Okay. <laughs> you know, when you're teaching Pilates, I feel so relaxed. I'm like, okay. Your voice is Great. very calming as well. <laughs> Inside it's like, ah! <laughs> it's literally Luna. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been such a pleasure. And I think we've just had the rain start for us. So we'll have to go rainbow hunting. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for Kayla. having me. You're welcome.